And we are just thrilled so many of you are able to join us um, for our run up to SEL week. As some of you know, some of you are familiar names, some of you are new. Um, we have been offering nine webinars and um, workshops this week of SEL week and the run up to SEL day on Friday. So um, it's just great you could join us. My name is Liz Hansen Warner, and I am the president of SEL 4NJ. And together with many colleagues, um, we are just thrilled to bring this workshop this afternoon to you. Um, but before we do that, I'm just going to share my screen. And, and we are going to um, I'm just need a quick overview about exactly um, what SEL Day is all about, just in case if this might be new news to some of you. Um, I have a feeling that this probably is not new news to many of you. So um, as, as you probably know, SEL Day is this Friday coming up. Um, and on Friday, all sorts of great things are happening at schools and organizations across the world. Um, there's also an international summit that's being planned by the organizers of International SEL Day. Um, so there's all sorts of things. Um, the, the people who are organizing SEL Day, it's a number of partners kind of fronted by the Urban Assembly and SEL for US. The international partner is Six Seconds, which is very exciting um, to be bringing on schools from all around the world doing just amazing things. And some of the, the celebrations in some of the countries have started a bit early. We've received um, some clips from things that are going on in Ukraine, as well as um, in Vietnam. So that's just very cool. Um, just so that those of you who may not be aware, SEL4NJ is an affiliate of SEL4US. And as you can see from this map, that there are states all across the country um, the SEL4 US was launched in 2018, so it's a relatively new organization. SEL4 NJ um, was one of the um, founding states, which we're very proud of. Um, but as you can see, that it's there's there's advocates, there's friends, there's supporters of high quality best practice SEL all across the country. Um, as mentioned before, we were one of the founding states. Um, and as of this morning, I believe we have almost 2,700 members of SEL4NJ comprised of people from schools, from associations and organizations, SEL providers, as well as community partners, all united in the understanding and belief that strong social emotional skills really provide the foundation for thriving for all of us. Um, and should be mentioned that we are a 501c3 all volunteer organization as well. And um, there's there's people on the Zoom today who have just worked so hard to bring this um, to you all. Um, so this is kind of what we did. We talked about that. And what is SEL Day? A um, couple of ways of participating in SEL Day, um, which is really just kind of sharing the great stuff you're doing in schools already. So we call it creating an artifact and sharing on social media. And just if you do that, um, please just, um, you know, hashtag, hashtag SEL day and tag SEL for NJ, any other organizations you'd like to give a shout out to as well. Um, and it's really an artifact can be as big or as small as you'd like. Um, even if it's just, you know, a picture of a person making a heart sign, you know, that counts as well. This photo was taken from the second um, SEL day, um, which is the first year we were back in school. Um, that's why the kids have masks on. So um, it's been a great massive success. Um, last year, 40 million views. Um, so spreading just like happiness and examples of people doing great kind things, um, it, it counts. Um, also had a bipartisan resolution last year um, for SEL week that hardly ever happens um, and many, many participants. So um, again, social media platform of your choice. Um, we used to be all about Twitter, um, kind of moved away from being all about Twitter and all about X to whatever works for you. So we will find you and share and like your posts as long as you hashtag SEL day and um, tag SEL 4NJ. So again, um, that's what we kind of went for, um, just gone through. So please, please, please sign up at seldayorg 
and there's lots of resources as well. And um, so today we're hearing um, from our lovely friends and partners at at SCL at Arts at, sorry Arts at SEL. I'm so used to calling it um, anyway SEL. Never mind <laughs> Arts and and J. Um, so we're just thrilled, and we have a whole team that's here that's going to be talking about the, you know that wonderful intersection of SEL and the arts. Um, so with that said, I am going to stop talking and turn it over to our lovely friends and partners um, who are going to talk to us all about SEL and the arts. So over to you, team. Thank you. Yes, we really appreciate all that you've put, um, all the effort this entire team has put into today and SEL day and the entire week. Um, it is truly inspiring. Um because I know everybody has another job, full-time job. So it's very meaningful. Um, and we're glad to be able to present today. While we're, while we're sort of um, waiting, I hope people will make sure that you share your pronouns. If you know how to rename yourself, that's really helpful to us with your pronouns, maybe your organization. And if you have a connection to the arts, because so much, um, you know, and that connection might be just your love of the arts. It might be you're a teacher of the arts, um, whatever that is. It just helps us because our work goes um, multiple ways, and as we'll explain later. I am Wendy Lisko. I am. I wear two hats today. I am the executive director of Arts Ed New Jersey, and I am executive director of the Center for Arts Education and social emotional learning was no wonder. Yeah, it's hard to remember those long titles, um, but that's what we are. And um, I'm here today with our co-directors of practice and learning and research, um, Yorel Lashley and Dr. both doctors, um, Scott Edgar and Kira, the director of programs and partnership. And we are just gonna take uh, like 30 seconds to introduce ourselves. Each of us will be presenting later. Um, and how we came to this work. I've been a long time um, theater director, producer, dramaturg, um, educator, um, and uh, philanthropist for many, many years, and now um, have been at Arts Ed New Jersey and leading this center for about almost two years. And I'm gonna hand it over to um, you, Kira. Thanks, Wendy, and thank you, Liz. Um, I know how much coordination it takes to bring this day um, and this weekly celebration now um, through your volunteer organization. Um, so thanks so much. Um, my name is Kara Rizzuto, and I use she and her pronouns. And as Wendy said, I serve in the role of Director of Programs and Partnerships for um, the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning. My role at Arts Ed New Jersey is the Director of Learning Programs, and I'm so delighted to be able to be here today with the full team, um, and I'll pass it along to Scott. Thank you so much, Kira. Such a pleasure to be here. Uh, two seconds of my backstory. Both of my parents were social workers, and I was a K-12 band director for 10 years. And I realized that my uh, students wanted me to be a social worker, wanted me to be a therapist, wanted to be to be a counselor, wanted me to be dad. And in the end, I realized I was a music teacher. And so I discovered social and emotional learning about 15 years ago. And over the last 15 years ago, it's been my uh, my professional work's goal to really figure out what is that intersection between music education and arts education and social and emotional learning look like. Uh, so fast forward, I come to you from Lake Forest College, just a little bit north of Chicago, and I'm thrilled to be able to share uh, this hour with my wonderful colleagues uh, at Arts at SEL, and I'll pass it to Urell. Thanks so much, Scott. Uh, it's a delight to be here with everyone today. My name is Urell Lashley. Uh, I was a, have been a professional musician for a very long time and gigged in New York for 12 years as a Latin percussionist. Um, and play West African, Afro-Cuban, Afro-Brazilian percussion for a long time. And that inspired me to think about how I could use that experience to work with young people. And out of that came a program called Drum Power that I founded in 2001 to help young people practice life skills through 
becoming musicians and through the effortful work that we know that that is, but also through the joy and vitality that we know that that brings. And after a while, I started to get interested in wondering, well, what this kind of program was helping them do at the cognitive developmental level, which which uh, prompted me kicking and screaming to go back to school and uh, get a PhD in educational psychology, focus on human development. And I've been doing a lot of professional learning work as a result that to just support healthy classrooms um, and, and support teachers and support young people. And so uh, now I'm at the University of Wisconsin-Madison where I'm speaking to you today, um, both directing programs in an office of professional learning and also happily serving as a co-director of practice learning and research for the Center for Arts Education and Social Emotional Learning. So with that, I'll throw it back to me, Wendy. Thank you. Yeah. We were really are looking forward to jumping into the content, but wanted to give you a little bit of background about how we came about. And, um, and then we are going to talk about some of the key pillars and tenets of artistic SEL. We're going to demonstrate a little bit about how what it looks like in action, share some about our approach to professional learning and the resources that we have ready and available for you to get started. So, but first a little bit about the center and how we came about. Um, back in 2019, it was actually at an SEL for NJ meeting where there was a conversation about the relationship between SEL um, and the arts and how the arts were a natural um, avenue for SEL. And, you know, you may have heard many people talk about the arts as um, driving the soft skills in young people. And we were starting to, we knew that those skills were really the power skills that students need for life and for academics and their future. And so we started to see that the conversation was recognizing those power skills. So we spent a year and a half, my predecessor and a team of um educators from across the state and across the nation came together to do a crosswalk between between SEL components and arts ed. Um, and it's a framework that we'll talk about a little bit more later, but it really led to a conversation with a lot of national partners. And before we knew it, it became clear that this was a New Jersey specific need and a national need. So um, our partners, we came and created the center with this vision to imagine a world where everyone engages in the arts to support a strong sense of identity, agency, and belonging. Three pillars we'll talk about more later. So in order to gain a healthy and functional awareness of themselves, make positive contributions to their communities and have power in their own lives. And they, um, it's a big vision and we actually believe that the arts combined with SEL can get us to there. So the center was created to champion arts education and social emotional learning to, and be, um, to facilitate an embedded intentional and sustained application of arts. So there are um, operative words here around identity agency and belonging and embedded intentional and sustained that we will be talking about later today. Um, we also just wanted to give you a sense of what we're talking about when we say what is artistic SEL. Um, artistic SEL intentionally embeds life skill development into artistic processes and practices. So it's in service though to student empowerment to both enrich artistic fluency and human development. So that's really the soft skills that become power skills in our minds. Um, and you know, you'll notice as we talk about this, we see this is multi-directional, that the SEL, the artistic SEL will improve how arts educators can um, um, sh sh teach their arts. Um, as well as if for non-art teachers to be able to inf use the arts to advance SEL practices. So this is why we're going to be talking about it in sort of a multi-directional way. So no matter where you are coming from um, and what seat you're wearing or what hat you wear, this 
can work for you. So why don't we just, just jump into the content? All right, Wendy, thank you. So um, a little bit of history in terms of how we've gotten to define SEO, SEL and the way that we've chosen to do so. Uh, go back to uh, the roots of where many of us found our way into SEO, and that's through the influence of Castle. And we started with those Castle Five, thinking about self-awareness, self-management. And back in 2017, when I started to really start to think about how do we operationalize those five elements of social and emotional learning, in the arts classroom, it really started to manifest that it wasn't necessarily five areas of work, but three, that we could combine certain areas and how it was operationalized and presented through pedagogy. We could think about self-awareness and self-management together in this area of self-exploration. And we could take social awareness and we could have that be combined in a way that was with relationship skills. And that sort of became this awareness of others in our space. And then responsible decision making had its own space that we could start to target and work through building those skills. It led us to a place that worked for a while. Uh, but then through the inspiration of Rob Jagers and others, we discovered that it really was almost positioning social and emotional learning as something that we're doing to students instead of something that we're doing with students. So the three areas of identity, belonging, and agency that Rob speaks so powerfully to really started to resonate. And we started to figure out that, well, when we're really talking about self, we're talking about identity. We're talking about a deeper understanding of who we are, about what we're bringing to our spaces. And when we're talking about how we engage with others, well, we're really talking about how do we facilitate a space where our students feel safe being vulnerable or even dare to be brave. And we know that that is a prerequisite almost for meaningful artistic work, whereas other subject areas, students may be able to hide behind a pen or a test or work, the arts almost mandate vulnerability. It mandates putting yourself out there and necessitating that safe space. And that brings us to this final area of work that we champion, which is that of agency, that our students really can make a meaningful difference in their classroom, school, and community when they're given the ability to do so, when they're given the space to do so. So when we look back at that definition of how we've chosen to define artistic SEL. It really is based upon how identity, belonging, and agency manifest in the arts classroom. Um, I'll be blunt for two seconds that uh, it's not lost on us that many people have different definitions of social and emotional learning, especially now. And I actually think one of the reasons why some of these very definitions have evolved is because SEL became amorphous. It became so big that people really didn't know what people were talking about. And it allowed cracks for people to say, well, no, they're doing mm, mm. So uh, one of my big champion points is that we need to be precise with our language. We need to be exact with our language. So uh, it's very important for you to know whose definition of SEL we're using. And our definition is identity, belonging, and agency. And that's our areas of work. But that's not enough just in and of itself. So those to us are our nouns. What are we presenting? Uh, we also need to talk about how that's going to be unique to arts education and what criteria need to be in place for that to happen. Kira, can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, we do believe that there are tenets that make this work unique. And the first is that it needs to be embedded into our content. And for us, that needs to be artistic, that the social and emotional learning work that we're doing cannot feel like it's one more thing on the arts plate. It needs to be embedded into the arts content. And in arts education, we typically look at our arts pedagogy in four categories. Either we're creating art, either we're performing or presenting art, we're connecting to art, or we're responding to art. And those four areas are ways that we've conceptualized that social and emotional learning can map onto very, very cleanly. And we start to think about many of the areas that we're going to suggest in the next little bit that social and emotional learning and arts education are congruent. It's based upon those areas. Now, the challenge is many of um, 
folks kind of assume that when we talk about arts education, we limit ourselves to just performing or presenting our artwork. Well, the wealth that is available when we look at creating our art and students creating art, connecting and responding, the doors open wide. So that's this idea of embedded, that we're working on artistic fluency and life skill development at the same time through the same routines and processes in our classrooms. But it also has to be intentional, that we need to believe that both of those are on equal footing. And typically in arts education, sometimes guilty as charged, we paint ourselves into a corner that it's product-based, that it's the quality of the concert, that it's the quality of the play, quality of the painting. And that process of embed intentionally embedding opens that up a little bit. And it leaves us with this last criteria that it needs to be sustained. That typically, um, sometimes we see SEL relegated to maybe one period a day. We see SEL relegated to five minute icebreakers at the top of class. And we truly champion that social and emotional learning needs to reach a level that it's part of our climate and culture in our classrooms so that it's part of everything that we do. It's part of the very fabric of our arts education classrooms. And that leads us to this fourth element at the very bottom uh, point that you see here, and that's it's visible, that we're being very, very clear with our students that the life skills that they're learning in the arts classroom are going to serve them outside of the arts classroom. And that's a very, very important part because I think that sometimes we hide the wizard behind the curtain and we need to share that with our students that what they're working on here is going to benefit them out. All right, Kira, next slide, please. So I'm going to lead you just very briefly uh, on a, you say, Scott, you know, what does artistic SEL look like? I'm so glad you asked. So we're going to go ahead and spend uh, a little bit of time experiencing uh, something that we could do. Um, our friends at Disney Pixar released a beautiful movie uh, about emotions, and they released a beautiful movie about the life of Riley, a teenage girl, and the five core emotions that live inside her head. We have anger, we have disgust, we have joy, we have fear, and we have sadness. So those are our five core emotions. They brought in psychologists, they looked at core emotions, and this work is largely pretty accurate in terms of the five emotions that are rooted in many of our, our bodies as we speak. The challenge here is that, you know, a lot of times people say a core skill around SEL is emotional vocabulary building. Bingo. Yes. So we need to be able to put words to how we're feeling. Uh, but a lot of times people are framing this as positive and negative emotions. And I, I encourage us not to think in that way, but to think in terms of more up and down emotions, that we have up emotions, we have down emotions, and all of those emotions live on a continuum. The challenge when you look at these five emotions is that we only have one up emotion and four down emotions. Joy is an up emotion. And then we have anger, disgust, fear, and sadness as a down emotion. Now, that does not mean that there's any more of a challenge. It just means that we need to learn how to embrace all of these emotions. And so I'm going to encourage us uh, to become aware in our lives sometimes, visibility, of when some of those emotions might pop up and realize what are maybe uh, small versions of that emotion. What's a small version of joy and what's a deep version of joy? Well, it might be amusement and manic or something like that. What do those words look like? Now, in our world, so you might be saying, okay, Scott, so that sounds good. That's an SEL experience that you just let us in. Great. What does it look like when we start to make it musical? Here, next slide, please. Well, the trick now is to figure out that almost everything that we do in our world has a soundtrack. We can't escape music. It's around us always. And our neuroscience friends have helped us out by suggesting and doing a lot of really powerful brain work that music actually elicits emotion. It doesn't elicit perceived emotion. It actually elicits exact emotion in our body. And there are multiple different ways that people choose to engage with music when they're in a different emotional state. So I've done some research to look at this. And some people, uh, let's say, for example, if you're in the down emotion of sadness, some some people want to listen to uh, happy music, to maybe try to draw them out of that emotion. But sometimes people want to listen to really, really sad music, to embrace that emotion, to deepen that sensation. So I'm going to ask us just for uh, just a, a few minutes, for a few minutes, I want us to create an emotional soundtrack for ourselves. And we can utilize the chat for this. So I would love for you to think about music that you adore, that is powerful for you, that you listen to, that might give you a deeper sense of 
uh, what humanity means for you. And I would like for you in the chart, uh, sorry, in the chat, to look at this chart and just think about what is music for you that feels joyful? What is music for you that feels sad? What is music for you that might feel afraid? What is music for you that feels disgusted? And what is music for you that feels maybe angry? So in the chat, do me a favor and literally please just write joy, sadness, fear, disgust, anger, colon, and then let's find out what music is in your hearts now. Give you a few seconds to do that. While we're typing, Joy, Dave Matthews Band. Thank you, Michelle. That's great. My guess is that might be a personal experience. There's not a specific song there. So maybe it's just an association with that band. Dave Matthews Band defined a lot of my high school years. So that, that certainly brings joy to me. He makes me smile too. Absolutely. Thank you for that. Joy, good days. Absolutely. Thank you, Delilah. That's great. So much of disgust, I start to think of uh, some of Alanis Morissette's music. Joy, Christian music. Thank you, Evelyn. Okay, and Sarah, Joy, Love on Top by Beyonce. Sure. Evelyn, thank you, Romantic, Spanish Ballads. Yeah, so that might be Joy, depending on where we are in our relationship. That might go to sadness, fear, disgust, and anger next. Uh, so much of what we talk about is about association that we have with music. And, uh, you know, you can think back to that that song that you had with maybe a, a significant other or a partner in high school. And either that song still has pleasant memories or it doesn't. Uh, so the association, it's not necessarily just the affect of the song. Laura, great. Thank you. Joy, Grateful Dead. Good love. And thank you for this. You know, let's think about the applications and keep them coming. Yes. Thank you. Sadness. 16 carriages. Thank you. Joy. Lizzo. Absolutely. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you. Keep them coming, Sarah. Fear, instrumental music. Instru interesting, Sarah. Absolutely. Lovely day, Bill Withers, one of my favorites. Thank you, Joy. Um, interesting. So you think about the applications of this. And this is something that would be either responding to or connecting with music. There's very little creation or performance that is needed. We don't have to have a lot of artistic expertise to engage in this area. So I would encourage you, now you have a soundtrack that you can play for students that are coming in. This is very culturally relevant to the music that's meaningful for them and gives them a space to really understand, hey, we're listening to music that is meaningful for you that engages with emotional vocabulary. I can define Find music, excuse me, I can define the emotion and I can link it to a sonic entity, music, that exemplifies that. Here's how we have embedded, intentional, sustained artistic SEL. All right. Thank you very much. I'm going to pass it on to my next colleague. And just really quickly, because uh, we're running a little short on time, this is an example of what this could look like in student work. So this is something that our colleague from New Jersey, Shana Longo, talked about with kinesthetic drawings. So she literally had students just put pen or crayon on paper and put music on and had them do continuous motion to reflect some of those emotional feelings that they were having. So when we talk about an artifact, this is a good example. All right, thanks so much, Scott. So uh, once again, Dr. Urell Ashley, I'm gonna talk a little bit about letting, showing you a little bit about what that actually looks like in the way of professional learning as we, as we support both students and practitioners and districts and sort of all the folks who are in the work of trying to support young people to be more agentic and more powerful and more knowledgeable and prepared for, for, for life now and then beyond. So for us, there really is no one way or prescriptive way or set curriculum to embed SEL into arts education. Uh, through the center, we actually approach and guide educators to better understand their practice and their classroom as a rich space for social emotional growth through the arts. And, and that that work usually takes on the form of us providing opportunities to talk about skills, to really refine practices, to make sure there are elements of modeling that we're modeling, but also that peers are modeling, that peer-to-peer -peer work and collaboration um, as a center, because we know that we all have different things that we do that are relevant for one another. And we often, we sometimes don't get the time to really be able to share those experiences and share those techniques 
So one of the things we take a lot of time and energy and enjoyment in doing is facilitating that op that sort of an opportunity. And then finally, that there's always elements of self-reflection um, of the dance between self-reflection, planning, and then application. So applying the tools that, that we're supporting each other to develop and learn, and then getting feedback. So one way to also think about is that we also follow roughly this process that you see on the slide for professional learning, where first we reflect on what are we doing currently? Um, you know, what, what do we have questions about? What do we think the outcomes are that we're seeing? Um, what are the wonderings that are bubbling up based on, based on the things that actually we as a center would be sharing through the content that we give folks for thinking about the foundations of social emotional learning and artistic social emotional learning more specifically. And then we work to try to work as a unit or a group to both work individually, but also collectively to ground and connect to our purposes, to the individual purpose. What are we trying to help and guide students through using the artistic SEO work? What are the challenges to consider? How do we start to think about implementing the new learnings? Um, and what do we need to start designing? And then we reflect a little bit more on what are the action steps. Sometimes that means building with colleagues and planning together if it's as teaching teams. Uh, sometimes that means preparing for the specific realities of the ways our work looks. Some of us are unfortunately teaching 30 minute blocks, right? So we got to plan for having shorter amounts of time. And then moving to actual planning and implementation to refine what we have to figure out what the next actions are, but to do that by actually trying things. And sometimes for our professional learning, we actually have folks peer teach. So teach one another an actual lesson that they've developed and then get feedback specific to the outcomes that they set for themselves. And we talk about what that can look like, or what it did look like, and then where refinement is. So the most important thing to realize is just that we view this work as really hands-on and really about being in the business of actually applying things and not just defining ideals and values, but planning actual pieces that we will implement and then getting feedback on, on what that looks like. So we can we move on to the next slide. I'd like to share a little bit about sort of generalizing what that looks like um, and also share a few examples. So as I said, skills and practice, modeling, peer-to-peer -peer work and collaborations, and then self-reflection and application with feedback. And to, to date, we've had a number of different projects and we'll share two that just look very different. So through Save the Music, which you'll hear a little bit about more when we talk about resources later, um, we have a partnership. We had a partnership and it continues because these resources are still available online. But through the center, we created a series, which was a free program toward student empowerment through SEL and music education that featured a number of guests from across the United States um, and captivating conversations really through, through webinars that folks could attend and featured folks like Dr. Gloria Ladson Billings and Connie McCoy, Franklin Willis and Jonathan Taylor Rush, a, a combination of folks that some of whom are educators at higher ed in schools, but also are teaching artists and also are musicians and, and music educators at the highest level to really just have conversations around what are these different elements uh, for helping and supporting students? How do they look? What are the key things that we need to consider to be able to put ourselves in a position to be able to do that effectively? Um, and what are some of the, good, of the powerful stories of that keep us inspired and, and, and grounded in the work? So that was one example. And then we are currently in the midst of the last of three years of cohorts through a project called RAISE with, with young audiences, which um, is about 150 art educators from across the country. And we're supporting them with artistic, social, emotional learning, professional learning, and helping them really make that work embedded, intentional, and sustained through a virtual learning synchronous series of gatherings that include content that we developed and facilitate along with the processes I just shared. So all the peer modeling and modeling and so forth um, and self-reflective work. And we are soon to be 
gathering some of the data from that to sort of think about whether we're achieving the outcomes that we've set out to. But each year we've done that and it's grown and developed more. And there's a ton of peer modeling in that that I think is a, is a, is a relevant and important example to think about what professional learning can, can look like uh, when done um, in a very intentional way. So with that, I'll pass it back to Kira to talk more about key assets and resources that we have for this work. Thank you so much. Um, so I imagine um, some of what you've heard today may be new to you. And we want to make sure that you know how to follow up, go a little deeper about um, some of the resources that were already mentioned, and also to let you know about some other things that live on our website. So this is the landing page for the center, and you can see at the bottom the URL. Um, at the top, at the navigation bar, um, what you'll notice is the Artset and SEL framework, and that's the framework that Wendy mentioned, which really began uh, with a crosswalk of the um, artistic processes and the social and emotional learning competencies. Um, and then the next item is professional learning. Um, areas of work, if you click, it will show you all the different aspects um, that the center is intending to focus on now and in the long term. And then the resources. The resources section of the website is actually a searchable database that we uh, launched with the launch of the center. And so um, there's a lot of information to be found on this website. Um, and for that reason, we wanna walk you through, um, if you scroll down from the landing page to about the center of the page, what you'll see is um, that last year to celebrate uh, Arts and SEL, um, during the SEL day celebration, we were um, launching a collection, the Heart of the Arts collection. Um, and this was actually a compilation of these various heart of the arts briefs that have been published um, throughout the first two years of the center um, being in existence. And it definitely um, will give you much more detail about those um, foundational components that Dr. Edgar talked about, but also a lot of subtopics. And there are a number of different um, authors and voices and perspectives. So we're just really grateful to have been able to put it together into this one concise um, compendium of sorts. And um, this is actually an example of the um, the uh, artifact that uh, Dr. Edgar mentioned with Shauna Longo leading her students through the kinesthetic drawing um, experience. And what you see on this uh, screenshot is from the Heart of the Arts Brief, which is volume one, issue five, that, that Shauna really walks in great detail through uh, the lesson planning uh, template. So there's a there's a sort of structure um, that we offer um, for you to think about how to embed with intention um, the enduring understandings and the essential questions and some of that common vocabulary that comes from the arts ed and SEL framework. So um, you can see this example and others throughout um, that heart of the arts collection. This is another um, uh, on the landing page of our of our website, you can access, um, and I see that Dr. Edgar put it into uh, the chat also, you can access all of the archived uh, webinars that Dr. Lashley mentioned. We had a phenomenal, phenomenal um, just a, a contribution um, from so many different um, practitioners and academics that contributed um, to this series. And in addition to the archived uh, webinars, we have a reflection guide. Now this is specific to music, but there are a lot of general questions in there that could be applied to other art forms as well. So uh, the last thing that we've uh, launched just very recently, and I think that's in celebration of um, the way that we hope to be able to advance um, professional learning around um, artistic SEL is this new uh, page that shows you what our overview of offerings, um, what you know, sort of the objectives for professional learning that we've identified um, through various engagements from introductory experiences all the way through sustained experiences. Um, so please reach out with any questions. Um, I know we wanna save room for some Q&A, um, but we wanted to be sure that you knew where to find some of these tremendous resources um, that are living on the Arts Ed um, SEL website. So um, with that, I think we'll open it up for questions, yes? Can 
you can feel free to unmute or type it into the chat, whichever is easiest for you. I think we're we're pretty flexible, small group here. So don't be shy. If one of the questions is how to reach us, you'll be able to see on the last slide, we've included our contact information. Um, so um, you can reach out with any questions specific about content or maybe some general questions about things that we weren't covering in today's. I don't have a question um, yet. I know after I think about it, I probably will have a million, but I just want to thank you because this has really helped me. I'm currently a social worker at a, a high school and I just decided that I'm going to start a, a creative arts club. Oh, and I'm wow. like, I have to integrate some sort of social emotional learning by nature. And this was just so on timing, on brand for everything. So I'm just so grateful. And the resources. I'm glad to hear. Um, and if you have some questions, as you're getting into that process, things that are maybe more targeted to your scenario and the context you'll be applying or trying to, you know, think through and brainstorm, um, please do reach out. And it's it's great because I don't like to just do things right. Like there, when you do it with intention and with planning, I feel like it's more effective. So Absolutely. just like blew my mind. Couldn't agree more. Is it is it uh, Delia? Delia. Delia, yeah, couldn't agree more. Um, the most impactful way is with intention. Any other thoughts, questions? Hello, Laura Martese. <laughs> Hi, friends. Um, I, I don't have a question per se, but I do wanna share that I did take the course through the RAISE program. And I'm like a year out of it. And I do have the, the SEL skill sets and competencies, identity, belonging, and agency up in front of me above my monitor. And I'm right now doing two residencies that are SEL focused. I'm a dance and movement artist. And this conversation right now actually just prompted me or helped me to write a prompt for student and teacher reflection that I'm going to offer in two schools in the next three weeks. And I'm going to be very, this is about visibility, right? So, so I'm very grateful that you just, that I just stepped in the room here and heard this shared again. And I'm going to say to students and to teachers, what have you learned in our dance residency that you can use in other parts of your school day, your life as a classroom teacher, or other places where you move in the world? I love that one one drop in to a webinar has inspired that sort of spark for you to think about those reflective questions and and Laura the the guide um, that accompanied Save the Music, although it is music uh, focused, has a lot of reflex reflection questions and also some for students. So that may even be another resource if you're if you're wanting to develop further those reflections. Oh, that's great. I, I wrote that down, Kira. I'm going to go and look at that because it, one of the residencies, I'm actually tasked with a written docu document to, to reflect on, on what's happened. So that's going to be so helpful. Thank you so Terrific. much. Terrific. Yeah. Great to see you. Good to see you. You know, Laura, I've always thought you've done one thing that I've, many things that when I've seen you um, work with young people, and I love one thing that you do, which is you always say, kiss your brain. You know, when there's a good idea, you just, it's a, it's not like, oh, you're a good girl, or you're a good bad boy. You know, you're always sort of just good thinking. Still doing it, Wendy, all over the state of New Jersey. <laughs> I love it. So I knew I was going to have a question. Um, one of the things that has been a trend, I just started here a couple of weeks ago, but I'm just noticing things. A lot of students are coming to me and they're like, Miss, I'm bored. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? They're like, this school was boring. I'm like, okay, but I need more. Like what? And at the core, it's just they want more engagement as far as their interests and they want connection with their teachers because we have social workers, mentors who they feel connected with, but we're not in the classroom. So I, my question, I have three words because I, I'm, I struggle with words sometimes. Like how 
do you guys have quickly anything that could help in terms of like motivation and connection, but also bridging that gap with the creative and like bringing our all together in home, right? It's like, how can we keep them engaged and create these connections with the teachers, but do it in a creative and proactive way? I feel like actually what you're speaking to right now is the agency piece, student agency. And I have, um, I have witnessed Scott and Yorel speak to this beautifully. So I'd like to turn that over uh, for the two of you to weigh in. All right. Well, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so, uh, the lion. Yeah. Did I say it right? Yeah. Um, you, you're, you have already spoken just now all the important pieces. Um, but the issue always is how do we get at them and do we give the power and agency assign it in the right place? So what I would say is always is, you know, a lot of times if students are disinterested or disengaged with what they're learning, it's because they don't understand what's in it for them. And maybe there isn't much in it for them. Meaning we, we clearly there's stuff in it for them to get grades and pass and matriculate and all of that. But the always the starting point for me is that is to hope hopefully hope that the adults, teachers, and folks like yourself will ask them what their interest is first, because that's what's going to be motivating to them. They don't do that. No. And then and then take the next steps to figure out ways to connect those interests to the work that they have to do in class. And in fact, ideally to serve those interests. To, so I think a lot of your work obviously is gonna to be to get students to bring their best selves to the situations, but your work probably is more with the adults around to get them to approach it that way. Because if they don't, the students, you know, first we have to show the students that we care about them, right? Um, and then they will listen to us. And we have to show them that we have a pathway to something that they want. And if we fall short on either of those, oftentimes the connection, which you talked about, doesn't happen. But that's the source of the connection, right? And that's why identity is not just a skill the students have to practice, but identity also means that the adults make decide that it's important to know who their students are and that we know what's important to them and we know what communities they come from. And we do that by asking them about their experiences and what's real for them, rather than telling them who we think they are. Now that for some is a mind shift, but I, that's the work, <laughs> I think. Uh, with that, I'll leave it for Scott to to add if he, if he desires. You don't mess with perfection. Uh, Yurel does fantastic work with a group of students called Drum Power at, um, at UW-Madison. And one thing that he does brilliantly that he just encapsulated in kind of a big picture is he really simplifies core values into two or three actionable things. So I, I don't want to put words into what Yurel has really perfected. But for example, one of the be core beliefs is discipline. And you know, when discipline is something that is part of our fabric, that's that embedded, that's that culture and climate, that SEL isn't something we do, it's something we are. It reaches a level. We piece together these experiences till it becomes part of everything that we do. But just saying discipline isn't enough. Yurel really thoughtfully, uh, in collaboration with students, uh, defines it as using our power for good things, towards good things. And that's a really reclamation of that word uh, in Yurel's words, so that it really gets us to think in terms of what does discipline mean? What does it look like? And then there's accountability. So one thing that I would also suggest is that nothing about SEL is like, no, we're not going to have high standards. No, we're going to have high standards and it's going to be in service of everything else. So uh, so uh, with that, I do know we're getting close to time and I want to pass things back to Wendy and and thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, I'm so glad you shared that about the discipline piece because at first my st I literally felt like uh, my stomach churning until you helped me to redefine it. So thank you. Um, and thanks to everybody in this room for being here. We are available to um, answer any questions through all these things. We'll send any documents um, to um, Bill and Liz so that you can access them. Um, but you can find us on the website. 
And one of some of the things that we do is we have group agreements. And one of our group agreements when we're working with a group is often around expect and accept non-closure. Um, and as um, Yurel Ashley just said, you know, this is a mindset shift. And so we're gonna take bite-sized action and know that it's not, the work will never be done. And that's a good thing. We'll continue to do this work. And if there's any way we can be of service to you in that process, please get in touch. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. And what wonderful work it is. I mean, I think I could I could listen to all of you people talk all day and just the, the energy and the wonderful examples. So thank you so much. And uh, SEL 4 and j is just so thrilled that you're all partners in this work. And um, we will do everything we can to spread the word because there's um, Kira, when she was going through the webpage, she's not kidding. There are amazing resources and they're deep and they're rich and um, they're accessible. So um, really take a few minutes and, and click through there. I think it's, um, it, it, it is really, really something. And, and then you have all these, uh, you know, wonderful people on, on the screen as well. So thank you so much, Arts Ed SEL, um, now that I've gotten the acronyms in the right order. And of course, um, you know, Wendy and Kara, you know, we know you well, and it was lovely getting to know your two colleagues, your Ellen Scott and Dr. Edgar. So thank you so much. Um, and so what we're going to be doing is um, tomorrow, we are continuing this web webinar series. Um, there, we are, have three additional webinars tomorrow on um, how to obtain a leadership certificate in SEL and school climate. That is at 11, that is at 1140. We're hearing from school counselors on what does social emotional learning look like in elementary schools. And at 1255, we're hearing from our colleagues from the School Climate Transformation Project at Rutgers and Pat Wright from PSA about the NJ Sky um, survey platform, climate survey platform. So, and then Friday is SEL day. So thank you everyone. We hope you'll join us tomorrow and Thank you again for this wonderful, wonderful presentation. It is just fabulous resources and what a wonderful thing to be learning about and talking about and living every day. So thank you so much, everyone.